May I speak in the name of the living God, who is lover, beloved, and love overflowing. Amen. Amen. Uh, when I retired, um, now nearly four years ago, my primary project, as some of you know, was to write a kind of history of my great grandmothers. Um, and I find I didn't have what, really what it takes. I wasn't sufficiently obsessed with the writing. I also find it very difficult because the story was much more complicated and intertwined than I had realized. Um, I did find out quite a lot about my Irish inheritance, which I didn't know about. But they were all middle-class English women and none of them individually was at all easy to write about. And it was painful because in different ways they had experience of empire from the perspective of the privileged oppressor. And it wasn't that alone which put me off, but I just found I didn't have the energy for it yet, but perhaps it'll come. They say that more of us have started on genealogies and historical dramas um, in the last year than in a long time. And uh, perhaps we are nostalgic for a world which may never truly have existed, but seems to us more romantic or rock solid uh, than our own kind of escapism. St. Luke, the author of our gospel this morning, um, is a much better writer than I am, a superlative writer even. He gives us a sublimely crafted story of complexity, of pain, and of nuance. And he gives us the good news of Jesus Christ, all bundled into this one beautiful story. Good news for troubled times. Simeon and Anna are presented to us in an old fashioned temple costume drama set in the Jerusalem temple, a building which Luke probably didn't know and which has been flattened long before he writes about it anyway from Turkey. He delivers in this reading a backward looking, is it rose tinted? Not quite but a kind of security, but there's more to it even than that. Anna and Simeon, like Luke, were living in truly horrible times. Under a harsh Roman occupation, overtaxed, and they are coming up to Jerusalem, and them, they are in Jerusalem, in the temple, and Anna, a widow for great deal of her life, almost certainly dependent on handouts in the temple. And up comes another poor, overtaxed family, unable to buy the lamb, which would have been the normal offering when you brought your baby for blessing. They bring turtle doves. It's allowed, but these are real nobodies and probably not the only nobodies coming up to Jerusalem that week, hundreds of them. Anna herself, the daughter of Phanuel, named after Penuel, where Jacob struggled with the angel and saw his famous ladder. Phanuel, the face of God shining out, that should give us a clue. But Anna and Simeon don't see poor nobodies. They see the crowds coming up to the temple. And in those crowds, they see light. They look at this poor family, one of hundreds, and they see only light. How easily they might have trained their eyes to see darkness and despair. Goodness knows it was on the horizon, the destruction of the whole known world just round the corner, but no, they see only light. Here we are at the midpoint between the darkest day and the spring equinox. This is the closing of the Christmas cycle, the last day of Christmas. Traditionally, we bless our candles and our homes and bring to an end for another year all the many 
celebrations of light in dark places that we have celebrated over these last 40 days. And it's no accident that we share this moment with the people of Ireland, with the Celtic Feast of Imolc, and with St Bridget's Day, and the memory of the perpetual flame which Bridget kept alight in Kildare. I told you I discovered about my Irish ancestry, so I can't let St Bridget go past without telling you a little bit about it, because I think she's important for us. In England, we've neglected Bridget. She's in many ways more deeply revered in Ireland, even than St. Patrick, by whom she was baptized in the middle of the fifth century. She reaches back, however, into the mists of prehistory. She shares her name with a pre-Christian goddess. And she herself is a wild mix of the old Druidic, her father was a Gaelic chieftain of some kind, and her mother, who is supposed to have been a Christian slave. According to legend, she was born in the doorway of a barn at the moment of dawn, on the day of Imolc, the 1st of February, in the year 451. She was born between indoors and outdoors, in between winter and spring, in between day and night. She was born, in other words, in what we sometimes call liminal space, in a threshold place between realms and understandings. And that's what I want us to remember about her today. We've talked so much over the last months about thresholds and doorways and being in liminal space that I thought it was worth giving Bridget some attention. Her whole life is lived in this in-between space. And stories abound. You can look them up, but it would take me all morning to begin to tell you them. Tales of her extraordinary kindness to the poor. She avoided marriage, um, which she was determined to do, but one of the ways she did it was by giving her father's jewel encrusted sword to Christ in the form of a beggar, so that when her father brings her suitor back to the house, he dismisses her as a madwoman for fear that she will do the same with his possessions. She then gathers a group of women at Kildare, which is the sacred grove of Druid worship, and they take on the tending of the sacred fire that had been burning since time immemorial. She becomes abbess, probably of the first double monastery in the Western Church for both men and women. She was born in the fifth century, we know that, but with absolutely no sense of anachronism. Irish tradition has her as the barmaid at the inn in Bethlehem, as Mary's midwife and Mary's wet nurse, where she suckles the baby Jesus at her own breast. And again and again, we see in Bridget two worlds being brought together and made one. Histories woven together, the way of Jesus, the inclusion of women, ordained, some say, as a bishop, her care of the poor, and her care of the old pagan ways that honoured the earth and tended the sacred fire world. She moved everyone into a deeper synthesis, coming as she did at the overlapping of two worlds. In Bridget, we don't see any one culture stamping out the old, but are coming together of both into a new harmony. The best of both worlds, you might say. Real, rich syncretism. Words like syncretism or hybridity 
are not words which we are very not really haven't been very popular words in Christian theology. We tend to look down on syncretism. But it seems to me that in Bridget we have something pretty special. Bridget, like Simeon and Anna, is a liminal figure, an in-betweener, standing between the worlds they've known, the old soon to be destroyed, the temple, Malachi's prophecy, and the light that they've hoped for. Bridget, standing between two cultures, two ways of life, and all of us here, standing as we do, similarly, in a world where religions and peoples and cultures and our history is meeting, colliding and clashing at an unprecedented rate. Old ways no longer serve and are collapsing. New ways are struggling to be born, to take effect. We too are letting some things go and picking others up. What stance do we take? How consciously do we do it? Do we yearn nostalgically for the past and bury our heads? Or do we ditch the past entirely and with it the wisdom of the ages? Anna and Simeon and Bridget don't show us the exact way to be, of course they can't, but they do show us a way to hold and integrate some of the tensions in our world. And I think it would be a good exercise for us to think about vaccine justice, medical supplies, sanctuary for refugees and asylum seekers, to think more deeply than even than we do about a planet tipping rapidly towards climate disaster and how quickly and easily we can turn to violence to defend our own interests. We stand in liminal space. Anna and Simeon remind us to keep looking for light, to keep endlessly looking for light but not in places of privilege and power, but in unlikely places, unexpected places. And when we see that light, we are to lift it up, cradle it, cherish it, and celebrate it, for it is very precious. Christ found in frailty and poverty and in vulnerability, but nevertheless light for the world. So as we make the upswing towards the spring equinox today, let's not lose hope, but tend the sacred flame, look for the sacred light. And St. Simon, sorry, St. Simeon, Anna and St. Bridget pray for us.